January 1944 brought no respite for Hitler's hard-pressed Eastern legions. Since the Battle of Kursk the previous summer, the Red Army had been inexorably driving westwards all along the thousands of kilometers of front. Apart from a few local counter-attacks, there was little that the German army could do but fall back. They were outnumbered and outgunned. The best that they could hope for was that the long Russian supply lines would eventually force Stalin's men to halt and regroup. When that time came, the Wehrmacht might be able to use its superior skill to change the situation. But German advantages in training had been worn away by the long, hard battles of 1943. The Red Army of 1944 was vastly more capable than it had been the year before, and its commanders showed little inclination to stop fighting, just to suit the Wehrmacht High Command. Hitler still had designs on the east. No matter that the German army was on the defensive or that the Red Army was getting stronger by the day, the Führer still believed that the Wehrmacht could retain control of the Ukraine with its vast grain fields. All he needed was a little change of luck and his panzers would again storm forwards, retaking the industrial area of the Donetsk Basin with its vital supplies of iron ore and manganese. From there, he could again push southwest in the spring of 1944, using Kleist's Army Group A in the Crimea as a bridgehead to take the Caucasus oil fields. Even if that proved impossible, keeping a hold of the Crimea would enable the Luftwaffe and Kriegsmarine to dominate the Black Sea, protecting the Romanian oil fields at Ploesti. His generals knew better. After the failure of Operation Citadel, General Zeitzler, the Army Chief of Staff, wanted to establish a defensive line. Running from Leningrad down to the Dnieper and the Sea of Azov, it was to be known as the Panther Line, or the East Wall. Manstein, in command of the forces in the Ukraine, also urged a retreat to the Dnieper. Hitler would have none of it. If I let them build defenses to the rear, he said, it will only encourage the generals to retreat if things get too tough. He added that any materials for fortification would be needed to complete the Atlantic Wall. In the event, within two months, Soviet successes compelled Hitler to change his mind and the work was started on the Panther Line. Since they told him things he did not want to hear, Hitler began avoiding his generals. Requests for meetings were refused, even when made by his most senior commanders. But now the best were gone. Von Kluger had been injured in a car crash at the end of 1943. Field Marshal Bush had replaced him as commander of Army Group Center. And von Manstein, who kept on telling the Führer things he did not want to hear, was out of favor. On the Russian side, time was now briefly taken to consolidate the immense gains made since Kursk. But winter was the time of Russian victories, and the pause in the continuous string of offensives did not last long. Above all, it was time to bring to an end the ordeal of the people of Leningrad, now enduring their 28th month of siege. A passage out to the rest of Russia had been forced through in January 1943. Though enough to save the city inhabitants from starvation, it was under constant threat of German fire. Even so, it had allowed the evacuation of the sick, the elderly and the young. More importantly, during the last months of the year, it had given the Red Army the chance to build up its forces in the Oranienbaum bridgehead to the west of the city. A similar build-up took place on the main Leningrad front, and both were provisioned with massive artillery and strong tank forces. General von Kukla, the commander of Army Group North, had been well aware of the Soviet preparations and sought permission to retreat to the river Nava, which formed the northern limit of the planned Panther Line. But Hitler refused to consider any retreat. 
the Soviets struck on the night of the 13th of January 1944, when General Govorov's Leningrad Front attacked. A massive bombardment involved both the Red Army's artillery and the guns of the Baltic Fleet. Over a hundred thousand shells were fired into the darkness, and by morning, the infantry had driven the Germans back three kilometers. Two days later, a second onslaught by the Volkhoff Front was launched under a similar barrage, with a third attack towards Pushkin crashing down on the Germans the next day. Those first days of battle saw some of the fiercest fighting in the entire war. The German defences were sound, having been well constructed over many months. Most of the men were veterans. They knew that, once forced out of position, there was little they could look forward to but death in the freezing wastes behind. It took five days for the men of the three Soviet armies on the left to advance just eight kilometers. But at the end of those five days, they began to sense the first cracks in the German defense lines. By the 19th of January, Krasnoya Selo and the important heights of Voronya Gora had been taken, and the clearance of Ropsha was complete. In the process, the attackers had overrun the 85 heavy guns which had bombarded Leningrad so unmercifully during the bitter months of the siege. On the 20th of January, the Folkhoff front took Novgorod after flank attacks to the south across the frozen waters of Lake Ilmen. Leningrad front curved west to reach the Luga River and the Baltic. The German 18th Army was in danger of being cut off, and on the 28th, von Kuchler ordered it to withdraw back to the Luga. In spite of the fact that his action saved large numbers of troops from almost certain death or capture, Hitler was enraged. He replaced von Kuchler with General Model. Model stopped the retreat, but renewed Soviet pressure forced him to fall back to the Panther Line, a decision which Hitler reluctantly accepted. By the end of the month, the siege of Leningrad was over. Massive artillery salutes were fired there and in Moscow, and for the first time for 900 days, the people of the city could walk their streets without fear of Wehrmacht shells or Luftwaffe bombs. But the northern offensive was not yet over. Luger fell on the 12th of February. Second Baltic Front under General Popov drove west below Lake Ilmen, and when on the 1st of March the Soviet High Command called a halt, Soviet troops had reached the Skov and the shores of Lake Pipus. Now the Red Army stood poised in the wilderness of forests and lakes which runs along the Estonian border. Meanwhile, just south of Kiev, a battle of truly gigantic proportions was developing. At the turn of the year, the Germans had still held one small stretch of the Dnieper around Kanev, where they had thrown back the Soviet bridgehead. Behind them, to the west, they occupied a salient nearly 30 kilometers deep. At its base, it was more than 140 kilometers wide. But such distances were beginning to mean nothing on the scale of Red Army movements. And on the 24th of January, the battle of the Korsun Shevchenkovsky began. On that day, the right-wing armies of General Konyev's renamed 2nd Ukrainian Front smashed through the eastern end of the salient, driving forwards 12 kilometers in a day. Konyev exploited the breakthrough with the 5th Guards tank army. On the 26th of January, Vatutin's 1st Ukrainian Front attacked from the north. On the 28th, the two forces met, trapping 10 German divisions in the pocket from which all attempts to escape were doomed to fail. The equipment of four Panzer and six infantry divisions, plus 18,000 men, were abruptly wiped from the strength of von Manstein's army group south. Yet this was just the beginning of a far greater strategic move. No more of it, however, was to take place under command of General Vatutin. On the 1st of March, as he was touring the front, his car was ambushed by anti-Soviet Ukrainian partisans, and he died later in Kiev General Hospital. Marshal Zukov, the Deputy Supreme Commander-in-Chief, once more assuming a dominant role on the battlefield, took his place. There was a brief pause in the center, but further south, Malinovsky's 3rd Ukrainian Front had opened an attack on the Krivoye Rog area, while Tolbukhin's 4th Ukrainian Front attacked over the lower reaches of the Dnieper. General Chuikov's 8th Guards Army took Krivoye Rog on the 22nd of February. 
and in some desperation Manstein transferred divisions down from the central sector, which for the moment seemed unthreatened. Zukov struck the weakened central positions almost immediately. On the 4th of March, his armies drove out through Koroshten in a huge arc, cutting down to threaten Tarnopol. By the 10th of March, they had reached the valley of the Dniester, with the Carpathian Mountains looming over the western horizon. Army Group South was still trapped in a pocket to the southeast. Here, they were attacked by armies of the 2nd Ukrainian Front, under the newly promoted Marshal Konev. The Soviets drove clear of the base of the German salient to reach the Dniester between Mogolev Podolsky and Dubnitsa. Manstein had thrown everything he could find into a defense of the rail link between Odessa and Lvov. This provided the best chance of escape from what was by now obviously a near fatal trap. Few of his armies had a chance to use it. Most were thrown back over the river Pruth while 1st Panzer Army, consisting of 10 infantry divisions, 9 Panzer divisions and an artillery division, was cut off around Kamenets Podolsky between Zukhov's forces and Konyev's. Perhaps there was a misunderstanding between Zukhov and Konyev about whose responsibility this pocket was. But at the end of March, the trapped German divisions formed themselves into a vast striking force. They burst out to the west, reaching the safety of the German lines at Buchach on the 7th of April. But in the spring of 1944, this was the only achievement the Wehrmacht could look upon with any satisfaction. By the end of March, the whole length of the bug had gone. Malinovsky's armies had driven from Krivoy Rog to take Nikolayev and reach the lower Dniester, while Trikov had swung his army further south to attack Odessa from the north. He captured it on the 10th of April, and by this time Konyev's troops were across the Pruth and into Bessarabia. The whole of the Ukraine, except the area around Lvov, was back under Soviet rule. The Soviet offensive showed up the Führer's plans for 1944 as the fantasies they were. Hitler blamed Manstein for the German failure to hold the Red Army, and on the 30th of March, he relieved the brilliant but arrogant commander. He was replaced by Modul, called down from the north. By now, Modul, upon whom Hitler relied to save difficult situations, was becoming known as the Führer's Fire. The traditional spring campaigning season was now almost at an end, but one task remained for the Red Army in the south, the reduction of the German forces in the Crimea. This was entrusted to Tolbukhin's 4th Ukrainian Front, helped by a newly created independent coastal army under General Yeremenko and by the Black Sea Fleet. It did not take the Red Army long. Kleist, who had been in command in the south since the drive on the Caucasus in 1942, was sacked at the same time as Manstein. He was replaced by General Schoener, a tough Bavarian mountain specialist who was another of the Führer's favorites. Almost immediately, Schoener was faced with an overwhelming Soviet attack. On the 11th of April, two armies broke through the narrow neck at Perakon, while Yeremenko's divisions drove westwards from the Kerch Peninsula. Both forces soon found themselves in a labyrinth of trenches, strong points and mined areas. But between them, they comprised 470,000 men, nearly 6,000 guns and mortars, and 560 tanks, supported by 1,250 combat aircraft. The German and Romanian forces, despite their extensive defences, were overrun in a matter of hours. Survivors fled back into Sevastopol, and by the beginning of May, the Soviet assault upon the port was ready to be launched. Four days of massive artillery and air bombardments were poured down onto specified sectors. These were followed immediately by assaults through streets, tunnels and trench lines by the never-ending stream of Soviet infantry, almost all of them now armed with submachine guns. By the 10th of May, the fighting was over. Sevastopol was once more a base for the Russian Black Sea Fleet. A small part of the German and Romanian garrison had escaped by sea, but most were dead or on their way to prison camps. Now, a lull fell along the length of the Eastern Front, from the Baltic to the Black Sea. The Germans could do little but count their losses and fear for the future. The Red Army, however, could lay their plans, strengthen further their lines of communication, amass supplies, and take considerable satisfaction from their recent achievements and their present condition. <laughs>
by the early summer of 1944. The Red Army was the biggest land force ever put into the field of battle. Close to 20 million Russian men and women were wearing service uniform. And although both the Red Air Force and Red Navy were enormous by any standards, the bulk of the fighting forces were in the Red Army. In the Army itself, a very high proportion were combat troops, serving at what the Western Allies called the sharp end, though the Soviet notion of a sharp end was more like the head of a sledgehammer. The Red Army was basically an infantry force with a primitive supply and administration service manned by soldiers of immense toughness and physical strength which enabled them to carry heavier loads for longer distances than most. Their birthright had accustomed them to far colder temperatures which they withstood on smaller rations than many in the West would have believed possible. No welfare services absorbed Red Army personnel strength but there were no such things as leave, regular pay, or even contact with the family. The Soviet soldier was trained to accept discipline of a type not seen in the British Army since the days of the Crimean War. He could also expect a high casualty rate, little medical attention if he was wounded, and none if he was ill, and very little food. One of the best of the German divisional commanders, Asso von Manteufel, later wrote, the advance of a Russian army is something that Westerners can't imagine. Behind the tank spearheads rolls a vast horde on foot or on horseback. The soldier carries a sack on his back with dry crusts of bread and raw vegetables collected on the march from the fields and villages. The horses eat the straw from the house roofs. They get very little else. The Russians are accustomed to advance for as long as three weeks in this primitive way. By 1944, the factories which had been evacuated beyond the Urals were at full stretch. They were turning out some 2,000 tanks and self-propelled guns every month, and nearly 9,000 aircraft. Moreover, those tanks and guns were largely of sound, reliable, and well-proven design. They might not have been as sophisticated as the German Tiger tank or the 88mm gun, but there were hundreds and soon thousands of them. When the new King Tiger appeared, it was powerful enough to knock out 10 T-34s within minutes. But it would be attacked by 50 of them at a time, being defeated by sheer weight of numbers. It cannot be said that many of the tanks and weapons sent to the Soviet armies by their allies were of much direct use. British infantry tanks saw some service down in the Caucasus, but elsewhere Western-made tanks were too narrowly tracked for the conditions in Russia. They were also too thinly armoured to brave the German anti-tank guns, as the British themselves had found out. But American supplies of basic material, sheet steel, leather, blankets, canvas tents, first aid packs and shiploads of iron rations were appreciated by the Soviet soldiers, though they rarely knew who supplied them. Above all, there was one major contribution that Western industry made to the Soviet advance. Over half a million motor vehicles, including 100,000 of the famous General Motors two and a half ton 6x6 truck, were putting the Red Army on wheels for the first time in its history. Now, the deuce and a halfs were hauling fuel, ammunition and supplies forward. Everything the vast Red Army would require to smash the German invader once and for all. One constant thorn in the side of the Germans was the tens of thousands of partisans operating behind the lines. Originally, small groups of men and women who vowed to fight on after the German invasion. By 1943, the partisan force had grown immensely. Controlled by the general staff of the partisan movement in Moscow, the guerrillas played a major part in the Battle of Kursk and the offensives which followed. In the war on the railways, guerrillas made more than 10,000 attacks on the rail lines moving German reinforcements up to the front. By 1944, however, central control was proving inefficient. The Moscow command was wound up, and partisan brigades were tied in much more closely with local military commanders, mounting operations linked to major offences at the front. The partisan war was brutal. Guerrilla attacks meant that the Germans had to deploy large numbers of troops to protect their communications. These were generally police units, foreign volunteers, and second-line SS divisions. They were not the best soldiers in the world, and their reaction to partisan attacks was often brutal. It was a no-quarter war 
with atrocities regularly being committed by both sides. But as Soviet troops advanced, they came upon the evidence of numberless horrors committed by the occupying Germans dating back to the first weeks of Operation Barbarossa. The men of the Red Army were already motivated by patriotism and the normal military companionship of arms, but fury at what they had discovered gave them added ferocity, wiping away any vestiges of compassion for their opponents. The Allied invasion of Normandy on the 6th of June, 1944, brought about what the German generals had most feared, an all-out war of attrition on two fronts. But although air units were sent westwards, the bulk of the German army in the east remained, with about half of its strength being kept on the Ukrainian front, where the heaviest attacks of the spring had occurred. They were in the wrong place. On the 22nd of June, 1944, Three years to the day after Barbarossa had been launched, the great Soviet summer offensive began, in the center of the front, not in the south. From Velikia Luki in the north, around a huge arc to Kovel below the Pritik marshes, the artillery of four Red Army fronts, 15 armies, opened fire simultaneously, while the aircraft of four air armies flew overhead. Infantry and tanks increased to more than 60% over normal establishment, moved out of their concentration areas and into the attack. Their objective was simple, to obliterate army group center. The largest concentration of German forces in the east, army group center, consisted of three infantry armies and one panzer army under Field Marshal Busch. It numbered more than a million men with a thousand panzers and 1,400 aircraft. But even that massive force was dwarfed by the 200 divisions amassed for Operation Bagration. Nearly 3 million men supported by 6,000 tanks and assault guns, over 20,000 artillery pieces and 7,000 combat aircraft. The Red Army aimed to smash through the German Army and all of its defenses. By destroying the center, they would also force the German and Finnish armies to the north and the German, Romanian and Hungarian armies to the south to withdraw. This was the offensive, which would finally clear the invader from the soil of Mother Russia. Bush, who had replaced the injured Kluger in October 1943, was a reasonably competent commander who had been promoted far beyond his ability. He was a devoted follower of Hitler, who appreciated the general's brutality as well as his habit of obeying every one of the Fuhrer's orders without question. In the winter of 1943-44, Bush had managed to hold the line in Army Group Center. He even mounted some reasonably successful local counterattacks. But he had neither the force nor the strength of will to do what was necessary when the full strength of the Red Army was thrown at him in June. Within a week, the torrent of men and tanks had cut off and then captured Germany's three main bastions in the east. Vitebsk in the north was isolated by converging attacks from Bagramian's 1st Baltic Front and Chernyakovsky's 3rd Belarusian Front. Mogilev was attacked by Zakharov's 2nd Belarusian Front. Bobrus was the target for Rokossovsky's 1st Belarusian Front. Rokossovsky's forces had moved massively but secretly over countless small rivers and lakes at night, attacking out of marshy ground that their opponents had considered impassable. Parts of two Panzer Corps were cut off and bombed into disintegration. And then, Rokossovsky's armies took Bobrus and 24,000 prisoners. On the 28th of June, Bush was relieved of his command, and Model, the Führer's fireman, was given command of Army Group Center, in addition to Army Group Ukraine. Model quickly realized that there was little hope of countering the massive Soviet drive at Minsk as he had planned. Instead, he used what remaining strength he had to hold open escape routes to the west. By the 4th of July, both Zakharov's men and Tchernikovsky's had driven forward more than 200 kilometers, leaving only one pocket of German resistance behind. That pocket surrendered on the 11th of July. Rokossovsky's 28th Army was approaching Pinsk, and except in the north around Dvinsk, the Germans had been driven back over the old pre-war Soviet-Polish border. The momentum never flagged. Everywhere the Germans were 
full retreat, although they turned and struck back ferociously at times. Nevertheless, armies of the first Baltic front forced the Divina and took Polotsk within days. Chenyakovsky's and Zakharov's armies, having already cut off 105,000 Germans as they crossed the Velocina, drove for Vilnius and Bialystok. They captured Bialystok at the end of the month, causing General Guderian to note caustically in his diary, Army Group Center has now ceased to exist. It was Germany's worst disaster of the war, worse than Stalingrad. 28 divisions had been totally destroyed and more than 350,000 men had been killed or captured. Immediately to the north, Chernikovsky's right flank drove on through Lithuania. By the end of August, his front had reached the borders of East Prussia. Further north, Bagramian's Baltic front armies crossed into both Latvia and Lithuania and sent an armored raid up to the Gulf of Riga. Brest Litovsk fell to Rokosovsky on the 28th of July, and soon afterwards his forces had reached the bug north of Warsaw. On his left, Chuikov's 8th Guards Army had stormed out of Kovel, capturing Lublin and reaching the Vistula, which they crossed on the 2nd of August. The approach of the Red Army was a signal for the Polish Home Army to rise in Warsaw. Under the command of Tadeusz Bord Komorowski, the Poles attacked German forces in the city on the 1st of August. They hoped that the Russians, just across the Vistula, would come to their aid, but the Russians did nothing. To be fair, the Red Army had just finished a massive drive through Army Group Center. Troops were exhausted, supplies were low, and equipment was unserviceable. However, their reluctance to help the Poles may have come from Stalin himself. The Home Army was nationalist and anti-communist, and it was in the Soviet dictator's interest to see it wiped out. Hitler reacted to the Warsaw Rising by sending in the SS with instructions to destroy the old capital. In two months of bitter street fighting, the outmatched Poles fought bravely, but resistance was ultimately spashed with great brutality. The uprising was finally extinguished on the 2nd of October. The blackened ruins of the city were not to be liberated by the Soviet armies until January 1945. Marshal Konyev's armies on the Ukrainian front had not been embroiled at the start of the offensive. On the 13th of July, they drove forwards against very strong resistance from Army Group North Ukraine. This was where the Wehrmacht had expected the Soviet onslaught. It was not until the Soviets committed two more tank armies on the 16th of July that this tremendous weight of men and firepower began to tell. The German defences cracked. 40,000 Germans were surrounded near Brody. Rokossovsky's right-hand army drove straight to the Vistula, crossed it, and formed a bridgehead at Sandomir. One tank army flanked Lvov to the north and another was thrown into a direct assault which captured the city on the 27th of July. By the end of August, the Carpathians had been reached along their main length. The Red Army had now driven right through Poland and was closing on the pre-war borders with Czechoslovakia and Hungary. In two months, the Soviet troops had advanced over 700 kilometers and now the time had again come to reorganize the supply lines. Their advance had been immensely costly, but it had inflicted even greater losses on the Germans. But to their south, another campaign was about to open, with perhaps more political motivation than military. The Balkans were as great an attraction to Stalin as they had been for centuries to his imperial predecessors, the Romanovs. On the 20th of August, Malinovsky's second Ukrainian front broke through the defences of Army Group Ukraine in the Pruth Valley opposite Yassi. By the 24th, they were near Leovo. There they met two of Tolbukhin's mechanised corps, which had forced the lower Dniester into Bessarabia. They had isolated the German 6th Army, reconstituted after Stalingrad, when political events intervened. A coup d'etat took place in Bucharest. Marshal Antonescu was overthrown. King Michael took his place. The government promptly sued for peace with the Allies and immediately two Romanian armies laid down their arms. Southern Bessarabia, the Danube Delta and the Carpathian passes to the north lay open to the Soviet armies. By the end of the month, Romania was in the process of being occupied by the Red Army. To the south, Bulgaria was about to be invaded by one of Tolbukhin's armies, driving down the Black Sea coast through Constanta. 
perhaps influenced by events in their northern neighbour. A group of pro-Allied officers now seized control in Sofia and welcomed the Red Army. So the invasion became a visit by friendly forces, who sped through the capital on the 15th of September. Collecting two Bulgarian armies, they pressed onto the Yugoslav border opposite Bor in the north and Skopje in the south. By the 8th of September, Malinovsky's armies had joined Tolbukhin's. On the 28th of September, they moved forward together to link up with Marshal Tito's partisans, while the second Ukrainian front drove in over the Romanian border north of the Danube. But the German army group F under General Weichs was holding open an escape route for both themselves and army group E under General Law, who were rapidly retreating from Greece. The Germans put up such a stout resistance that it was the 20th of October before Belgrade was in Allied hands and then only after the bulk of both German army groups had raced north through the gap. They joined a hastily forming defence line in Hungary, but yet another attempt to desert the Axis had been foiled. Admiral Horthy, the Hungarian dictator, had never been an enthusiastic follower of Nazi or even fascist doctrine. He had only agreed to cooperate in the war against the Soviet Union the previous March, when Hitler threatened a full-scale occupation of the country. On the 16th of October, Horthy declared a withdrawal from the pact and announced he wished for an armistice with the Allies. Before he could implement it in any way, he was kidnapped by the German commando Otto Skorzeny. German armies from Austria poured in, later to be reinforced by the formations from Greece and Yugoslavia. By the time Malinovsky's and Tolbukhin's armies had assembled for a drive-up from the Lake Balaton area, not only were the Germans in some force throughout Hungary, but Budapest in particular was strongly held and fortified. By November, the Soviet armies were fighting their way north on each side of the Hungarian capital, slowly, implacably, but at great cost and with little of the energy and momentum of the previous months. On the 25th of December 1944, when divisions of the two Ukrainian fronts which had fought all the way from the Dniester met to the west of Budapest, it was decided that with 180,000 Germans and Hungarians encircled, there was no chance of taking the city by storm. They therefore organized for a full-scale siege, calling up super-heavy artillery from hundreds of miles back in the Soviet Union, extra divisions from reserves, supplies and food from wherever they could be found. For the Germans, 1944 saw all hope of ultimate victory dashed. A few still believed in their Führer, but the Soviets had finally broken the once proud German war machine. Everywhere, the Nazis were in retreat, crushed between the Allies in West and East. Defeat was inevitable, but the final assault must wait until 1945.